Thank you for inviting us down here today to have a look at the probably the biggest rumour of 2016. Um, of course, the Canon 5D Mark IV. Um, let's start off with a fairly simple question of what are the main comparisons and differences to the 4 to the 3? There's a, the main, if you want to look at the differences really between the Mark IV and the Mark III, what you'll see is physically the Mark IV looks very, very similar to the Mark III in its button layout, um, where the, um, the menu structure is and this kind of thing. This is deliberate because we don't want people to uh, learn a new camera. We want people to be able to step up from the Mark II or from the Mark III straight onto this camera um, and start using it straight away. There's a couple of, couple of um, subtle little differences. Um, this, um, uh, the pentaprism bump here is slightly larger. Uh, than the Mark III and also on the back we've got an extra little button here which I'll talk about a bit later um, but other than that it's very very similar and this is this is deliberate but internally it's a completely new camera almost every single feature or function inside this camera has been changed and upgraded. Oh excellent so straight from the off people that have used the Mark III for the past three to four years that it's been out are going to notice an instant difference or is it going to be more of a gradual difference that they're going to notice? Well, what they find, when they pick it up, they can start using it straight away in the same way you would the Mark III. So it's not going to slow you down in your photography in that sort of um, respect. You don't have to relearn a camera. Um, but what they will notice straight away is the speed of the autofocus and also the image quality that comes off this. There's been a big step forward in image quality. So the target audience, same people? Or are you, are you looking to, for uh, Mark III users to kind of instantly replace? or is this going to fit in more into the lineup of the Mark III, or are you going to try and drag more people away from other brands towards the Mark IV? What's, <laughs> what's the target audience? This is going to be your Mark III user. Um, it's going to be that sort of person, the person who enjoys doing landscape, wildlife, sports, action, um, reportage style photography, um, photojournalists, a number of people who need a tool to do a job, so um, professional photographers who are looking for something incredibly reliable, incredibly dependable, are going to be looking at a product like this. This is um, uh, one of the best cameras that we have in the lineup to be able to do all different types of photography. If we go back to things like the, the 5D Mark II, um, that was a great camera for uh, landscape photography, portraiture, fashion, and this kind of thing but didn't really have the autofocus system to be able to do the sports and action photography. And then with, when the Mark III came along, that was our sort of fully rounded full frame camera at this sort of level. And this has really taken this a lot further. So this is a big leap forward from the, from the Mark III. So now we've kind of gone a, a very smooth look over of the new Mark IV and what it's designed for and who's the target audience and stuff. Let's get a bit more into the nitty gritty stuff. The fact that you've been able to make this slightly lighter and smaller, if I'm correct, how? Uh, <laughs> how have you done that? Have you had to make any, the only word I can describe it is sacrifices um, to be able to do this, or is it purely because technology's moved on, therefore components are smaller and, and so on and so forth? Well, it, it, as you mentioned, it's about 50 grams um, lighter, which I think is pretty impressive considering the technology that's in here. When we've added things like you've got Wi-Fi, you've got GPS and this kind of thing. So. Um, to have all this extra on here, um, something else they've managed to do is they managed to improve the weatherproofing, uh, which I think is really impressive considering, I mean, the, the Mark III is really well known for being a tough, durable camera. I mean, we don't quote any figures for how good the weatherproofing is, for, you know, um, mainly because you've got a big hole on the front here, so it depends on what lens you've got. Um, but we have improved it by putting extra grommets and seals on here. So to make it lighter, it's not really smaller. It does feel smaller because it's lighter, um, if, you, if you see what I mean. But um, we have made it, let's say, like the 50 grams lighter, which I think is really impressive. The way it's been done has been by changing some of the technology inside here. One of the things is the mirror box. So what we've managed to do is we've used um, lots of cams and gears and motors rather than using the springs inside here, which by having that redesigned has managed to make that lighter, which also helps to the weight saving of the whole camera. Um, there's very similar technology to what we've got the 5DS and 5DSR, um, but it just sort of shows how each little component, if you change it slightly, you can then add it up into a, a lighter package. So, speaking of big, big leaps, sensor, the rumours were saying literally about an extra two megapixels on top, <laughs> so that would make it a 26. What's, what's the facts? Okay, um, I'm not allowed to comment about rumours or anything like that, obviously. <laughs> but what we've got in here is we've got a brand new 30 million pixel sensor inside here. Now we have to remember we've got the 5DS and the 5DSR if you want those big, big pixel counts. And there obviously is a downside to having those great big pixel counts, which is why we have a separate camera for doing that kind of thing. 
This one we've gone for 30 million pixels, which is a good balance between resolution, detail, and also speed of shooting. Now, what's exciting about this sensor is that it's um, come from the same generation as the 1DX Mark II and the 80D. And those two cameras, the image quality from those two cameras, I feel, has taken a big step forward over its predecessors. So it's really exciting to have this sensor technology on this new camera. So there's a new generation sensor. Anything particularly special about it? Um, yeah, there's a, there's a couple of really interesting things. Um, it has a dual pixel CMOS AF. Um, on there, which um, is our, our live view autofocus system, which is the best live view autofocus system that we have. We have it on the ATD, we have it on the 1DX Mark II, we also have it on our Cinema EOS or some of our Cinema EOS series as well. And it's really nice to have that on this camera. Now, there's a new feature that um, we've got on here which we've never had before, um, which I personally am super, super excited about, um, and this is dual pixel RAW. And this is part of uh, this dual pixel CMOS AF technology. The idea of this is that you can adjust the sharpness and the resolution of your image after you've shot. So this, um, uh, using the dual pixel RAW, which um, every single megapixel that's on the camera is split into two, you have like an A and a B section to it. And using this piece of ex extra information, if you shoot in dual pixel RAW, you have two files, you have one whole file, and you have the other one which uses just the B information from each megapixel. And then using that information, you can adjust the parallax between the two, and you can adjust the sharpness and the resolution. So say for instance, if you're shooting and you've just missed someone's eye on the, um, on the sharpest point, you can adjust that very slightly. Now we're talking about um, micro adjustment here, mm. but you can adjust it very, very slightly. So another great thing you can do with it, if you're shooting, say, for instance, um, an animal through bulrushes, and the bulrush moves slightly in front of the animal's face, you can adjust that slightly and move the, the bokeh. Yeah. You can move that ever so slightly away from the um, animal's face. And this is a completely new piece of technology. Um, there are some other similar systems out there, but this works in a very different way, and this works using the, the um, uh, let's say, the parallax between the a and the B part of the, um, uh, uh, the, the megapixel. So this, this is super, super exciting for us. So you touched obviously that the sensor is vastly improved on the Mark III. Now the ISO and low light capabilities were pretty good in the Mark III. Have you been able to make any improvements into the Mark IV in regards to this? Yeah, so it's got a new sensor, it's also got a new processor, so it's got the Digic 6 Plus processor inside there as well. So you couple these, these two things together, it'll give you a, a, a real increase in low light capability. Um, that's always the danger with when you're, you're increasing the megapixel count, you're making the pixels smaller, so obviously their light gathering capabilities do change. But um, with this new generation of sensor um, and this new processor, we can now go up to ISO 32,000 before expansion which is telling you straight away that we have really, really good low light capability. How good it is compared to the Mark III? I haven't got a final one of these or a finished camera to be able to test it and check it yet, but it's really for you guys to tell us and also for um, the journalists to tell us. So we'll wait and see. So you've already mentioned that there's a new processor in the 5D Mark IV. What should we expect from it? So we've got the new Digic 6 Plus processor inside here. And the only other camera we've got in our lineup with that one at the moment is the 1DX Mark II. Now, the great thing this gives you, it gives you a much more powerful camera to be able to move information around. This has allowed the camera to now run at seven frames a second um, in normal shooting. And then if you're using live view, it'll shoot at four frames a second. And you get full AF and auto exposure when you're shooting like that as well. One of the other great things about Digic 6 Plus is the real improvements in the video capability. Excellent. So in regards to video, uh, are they true? Is, is what people on the street saying completely right? Has it got 4K? Yes, it has. I'm really pleased to say that it has got 4K capability. So you can shoot um, Full HD um, and you can also shoot 720 HD. What's nice about 720 is you can shoot at 120 frames per second. So you can shoot high speed, shoot, um, high speed with this one, which is really nice. But yes, as you mentioned, yeah, it's got 4K capability. Um, it's a DCI 4096 standard. Um, and um, it shoots at 30 frames a second. So if you remember like the 1DX Mark II, that will shoot at 60 frames a second at full HD. This one shoots at 30 frames, sorry, at 4K. This one shoots at 30 frames a second with 4K. Excellent, and in regards to 4K, is there any 4K photo capture modes on the 5D Mark IV or? 
Yes, you can. Yep, you can take stills from the yeah. 4K movie. So um, you can take a, a still frame from each one. But if you can't do, you can't do external recording. So um, uh, all the 4K has to be recorded internally. Um, because it runs at 30 frames a second as opposed to 60 frames a second, this allows you to record onto ordinary um, CF cards and also SD cards. So you don't need to use, or it doesn't have um, a CFast card slot. Right, so no CFast, unlike the one DX Mark II. Yeah, correct. And obviously it does have 4K video. And you also mentioned about external recording. If I can pick you up on that one, if that's all right. Um, Atomos, yeah. as you're probably very aware of, are the external recorders, and a lot of 5D3 users use them to help get a bit more broadcast quality. Is it compatible to a limit, I'm guessing? You can use it for full HD. Um, at the moment, 4K is only, um, uh, is only internal recording. So when the 1DX Mark II was released, it had a new AF system, which was, is, well, it is highly impressive. Has the 5D Mark IV got the same system? The AF system in here is pretty much exactly the same. So um, it's the same 61 point, um, the same F8 capability, which is really nice. You look back a few years, um, we didn't really have um, uh, the, the ability to accept people shooting with F8 lenses, whether they're using two times converters or whatever. But now you have a really good autofocus system, even if you're using, um, yeah, like I said, like the 1.4 two times converters, which is fantastic to have that on here. Now, the difference between, or the main difference between the 1DX Mark II um, and the 5D Mark IV AF sensors is really that the AF sensor itself, so the, the, the feature that's actually inside the camera, um, on the, um, uh, the Mark IV, the, the, the cover that's on the top of it, where the light goes in, is actually plastic, whereas on the 1DX Mark II it's glass. So what you find, if you're shooting in real extreme circumstances, like extreme heat or extreme cold, you find the autofocus on the 1DX Mark II will be superior, will be more accurate than this one, but it really goes down to those extreme circumstances. And that's the real main difference between the autofocus system. So the metering inside the 5D Mark IV got to be an improvement compared to the 5D3. Yep, it's the 150K um, RGB metering sensor inside here. But what's really exciting about that is this camera now has flicker detection or anti-flicker. We launched that first of all on the um, 7D Mark II. I have to say, people who've used it have absolutely loved it. It's great for shooting in, um, in environments where the lighting isn't ideal, where you've got the refresh rate for lights and this kind of thing. Now we have improved it. Um, on the 1DX Mark II and this one both have an improved version of it over the um, 7D Mark II. We've just changed the algorithm, the algorithm slightly. Um, that's really from feedback from the 7D Mark II, so there is an improved version of that. And the last thing about the AF really is that it will focus in minus 3 EV. So you can focus in practically moonlight, um, which is fantastic for wildlife photography and things like that. And then Astro, is it, would this camera be very good for Astro as well, purely because you can go into minus three EV or? Yeah, it will give you the, give you the ability to um, really shoot in uh, very unusual uh, shooting circumstances. You have to remember, we've still got the um, 60DA in our lineup if you really are into astrophotography. And it's great to have that breadth of products there to, to suit all types of photography. So you mentioned earlier that there's a Wi-Fi and a GPS unit built into the top of the camera now. Is this purely designed for tethering or image transfer or and the GPS purely just being for geotagging? What's, what's kind of the main uses you've purposely put these products into the back for? Well, it's great to have these on here. I mean, we know that this camera is used quite a lot by photojournalists, um, so we really want to make it as easy as possible for these guys to use. So, um, yes, we've got Wi-Fi built in now. Um, not only that, we've got NFC. There's also an FTP function built into the camera, which is the first time we've ever had that. So it really is a fully rounded um, Wi-Fi um, capability on here. You can still use an external Wi-Fi unit, and if you do that, you'll get more range. Um, but, um, but there is a really good uh, Wi-Fi um, solution inside here. And as you mentioned, yeah, it's got the, uh, the GPS um, built in here as well to really help with the, the location and the shooting. Now, the idea of this is to give as much information to uh, the files that's on here um, to make it easier to use for um, production houses and this kind of thing. And saying that, we've now added um, the IPTC function on here, um, which is super, super exciting for those photojournalists and people who work very, very quickly. Now, what that does is, using a piece of software that we provide, you can load more information onto the files. So things like where you're shooting, who you're shooting. So for instance, if you're at Wimbledon shooting a particular match, you can put that information onto the file as part of the, um, uh, the, the, 
the exit data, I suppose, that's on the, on the individual file. So then when you send that to a publishing house or gallery or wherever, they'll be able to archive it a lot quicker and a lot easier. This is a super exciting function to have on here and should really make a difference for the pro photographer who works in a very fast-paced environment. So looking at the camera and from what you showed us very briefly at the very beginning, um, the layout is slightly different as well as got a new, uh, looks like a slide button feature as well on the back. What's, yeah, what's new about it? Well, there's some great stuff on here. Um, one of my favorites, is it's now got touchscreen. Uh, I'm so excited to have touchscreen on here. I, you, I, obviously I use a lot of different cameras from Canon um, and I use a lot of the entry level um, kind of equipment and the, um, uh, the M series and this kind of thing. And you kind of get used to a touchscreen and then when you come up to this level it's like, oh, you really do miss it. So to have a touchscreen on here is great. You, and what's nice about this one is you can use it all the time, which is not like the 1DX Mark II where you can use it um, for certain functions for video capability. Um, and where I find it most useful has got to be for playback. When you're reviewing your images, you can scroll through your images and then pinch zoom to check that it's sharp and this kind of thing. So that is great to be able to do that. Um, also, when you're shooting movies, the touchscreen is active, so you can use it for moving your AF points around, so it makes it very, very quick for doing the sort of pull focus effect and this kind of thing. Now, the other thing I did mention about earlier when we first had a look at the camera is the little button here uh, that you've got. Um, this is new to this camera. I don't think we haven't got it on any, any other uh, EOS cameras. Um, we have something kind of similar on the 7D Mark II, but this is in a slightly different place. Now what this does is you can change what um, this top dial does by holding in that button. So I've, I've been playing around with this camera and basically how I've got it set up is I've got aperture on here, shutter speed on there. If I push that in, that then becomes ISO. Okay. So very quickly you can change the three settings, which I think is really nice. You can also change this to different things like exposure compensation and that kind of thing. Um, but it's really great to have that. So yeah, change your aperture, change your shutter speed, push that in, change your ISO very quickly. It should just speed up the way of shooting. Last difference, really um, a major difference here, is the remote terminals being moved to the front there. So you've got um, HDMI on here, you've got USB 3. Um, um, headphone socket, microphone socket. Um, so because of all these sockets on here, we've had to move you up the remote terminal to the front there. So there he is on the front. So in regards to the touchscreen, obviously you thoroughly enjoy it. There will be a few people out there that might be a little bit put off from it. Is it? Can you disable it? Yep, well those guys don't have to worry. You can fully disable the touchscreen if you want to. So you can set it up so fully disabled, you can have it standard or you can have it really sensitive as well, depending on how you shoot and what you're used to. I have to say, once my person wants to start using touchscreens, I can't look back. All the phones and everything are all touchscreens, so it does speed it up. So if people can give it a chance, I think they'll really like it, but don't worry, yep, you can disable it if you really don't want to use touchscreen. Battery life. Do you know if it's much improved in the 5D Mark IV or it's about the same in the 5D Mark III? We have to bear in mind this is running a lot more now with the Wi-Fi, the GPS and this kind of thing. It still runs on the LP6N um, battery. It still will take the LP6s as well, but you're better off using the LP6N, which we launched, I think, with the 7D Mark II. Um, as far as the final figures for battery life, I don't have that. Um, yet. Um, this is a pre-production camera, so we haven't got the final production ones yet. Um, we get them pretty much the same time as you do, so, um, uh, uh, so we'll have to wait and see what that is. But we will, that battery life is something that's very important to us along with um, the other features, so we will make sure that it does have the same kind of battery life as the, the Mark III. We do also have a um, vertical grip for this, um, which is the BG20. Um, uh, which is improved on the weatherproofing like this camera is, would also then take the two batteries. It also has some extra metal plates in it which helps with heat dispersion, which becomes more important when you're shooting things like 4K or shooting for a long period of time. But we really have thought about pretty much everything that could happen with this camera and try to um, make it, as I said, the best rounded package we can. It certainly sounds, looks, it's the works. It's what we were kind of hoping to see when we came here, you know, before we knew it was probably could have been an EOS M. But um, no, the fact that we've now seen that um, is incredible and I can't wait for um, our, our customers as well as anyone that gets a chance to use a 5D Mark IV. It's, it's an incredible piece of equipment. So thank you very much for having us here today. No problem, thank you for coming. So as you have seen in this video, the Canon 5D Mark IV is more than up for the challenge of replacing the beloved 5D Mark III. Now, if you wish to find out more information, release date, and the price, that can all be found on our website. 
But if any further questions, please do contact us. But until next time, thank you for watching and goodbye. Thank you.